Today we are starting a two-part sermon series called The Time Is Now. And I have intentionally chosen these lessons from the book of Haggai because of this time on our church's calendar. We are two weeks out from adding a second worship service on Sunday mornings. Two weeks, y'all. The time is now. The time is now. Two weeks from today, you will have the option of 9 o'clock in the morning or uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. Same songs, same message, same sharing communion together, same nursery and kids church happening twice on a Sunday morning. Please be inviting your friends. Please be inviting the people in your circle of influence because we are creating space just for them. Now listen, if you forget and you show up at 10 o'clock in two weeks from today, no worries. Come on in, grab some coffee, hang around a little bit, visit with the folks, the peeps from the first service because that will be wrapping up and then hang around for the second service. It might be like one of those moments when, oh man, I forgot to set my clocks back or forward. No problem. Nine o'clock or 11 o'clock. Like I said, this brief teaching series, it's from the Old Testament book of Haggai. And it's actually a series that several churches have worked through when looking at making big changes. This morning, I'm using a couple of points from a life church outline. But I got to tell you, it's not just about the time is now to do something new and different, like adding a second service. The main thought is a call to obedience, a call to obedience. Haggai is considered to be a minor prophet, but as we're going to see, a minor prophet with a major message for God's people some 2,500 years ago and for us today. So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to the book of Haggai. And some of you guys are are freaking out, like, where is that book? (laughs) It's only two chapters long in the Old Testament. It's after Zephaniah. It's before Zechariah. People with Bible apps on their cell phones are like, this is easy. All you have to do is type in H-A-G, boom, Haggai. It's right there. We're going to be in the first chapter, starting with verse 2. And I want to start by recognizing that we all have experienced a moment when we wake up in a certain stage of life and we have this unsettling feeling in our gut, this sinking feeling that, you know what, I expected more by this point in time. At this point in my life, I expected more. I'm 40 years old, man. I'm a man. And I'm kind of surprised that this is where I'm at in life. It can happen in any stage or season of life. You don't have to be old to feel this way. And it's not necessarily just in your individual life. It could be with your family or even with your church family. Maybe you're starting your third or fourth year of of college and you're thinking, by this time in my college career, I thought I would know what I wanted to do with my life and I still don't have a clue. It might be that you're out of college and you got a degree and you're thinking, well, since I have this degree that I'm going to be paying off for a long time, I should have a real job with real benefits by now, but that's not the case. I thought there would be more. It might be that you're a certain age and you're thinking, man, I thought I would be married by now and it hasn't happened. Or you are married and you're thinking, we should have a good marriage by now, but your marriage isn't what it should be. Maybe you thought, hey, let's have some kids. That will, that will fill a need for our family. But now that you have kids, you're super busy, you're extremely tired and extremely broke, and you're thinking, I expected more by this point in my life. Maybe you experienced a tragedy, a, a, a loss, and you don't feel like you've moved forward enough by this point in time. A lot of people have tried the religious approach and have joined a religion and then life doesn't really change and then we wake up one morning and we think, you know, I really thought there would be something better by now. We can feel this way with our church family. Local churches can feel this way. I don't know if you realize this or not, but this time next year, 
Cape Fear Christian Church is turning 50 years old. 50 years old. And we can think to ourselves, man, we expected more by this point in time after 50 years. This was the mood during the time when Haggai was written. The people were saying, we really thought we would be in better shape than we are now. By now, we expected a lot more. Before we dive into the text, I want to give you some very quick backstory. And I want to go back to the reign of King Solomon. During King Solomon's rule, he began the construction on the temple. During King Solomon's rule, uh, he constructed this magnificent temple for God. It was so amazing that people would, would travel from all over the world to, to see the temple and, and, and possibly offer worship to God. And, and I, I want to encourage you, I want to give you some homework. Go home and read Second Chronicles chapter 7. Read about how God's presence fills the temple. The construction of the temple was completed around the year 959 B.C. You're not going to be quizzed on it. Uh, any, anybody, any history fans? 959 B.C.? Yeah, you can jot down some notes. Um, it was finished in 959 B.C. Solomon passed away about 30 years later. The kingdom of Israel divides. People's hearts turn away from God. And instead of worshiping the one true king... They're worshiping these little kings and, and these little idols. What happened is they got distracted like we do. They got distracted. I, I was recently talking with the men's coordinator of the Christian recovery houses right here in Wilmington. And he said this. He said, addiction is a worship disorder. Addictions are worship disorders. And I think we all deal with our own worship disorders. It's not just drugs and alcohol. The Jewish people, they were worshiping idols. They stopped helping the poor. They turned a blind eye to injustice. And so God, he allowed a series of events to take place in order to focus the people's hearts back to himself. And in 587 BC, almost 400 years after the dedication of the temple, Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and his army crushed the southern kingdom of Judah. And this was completely humiliating. The destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish people, they're being held in captivity, later taken as exiles. But to add insult to injury, the Babylonians destroyed God's temple, stripping away the spiritual identity of the Jewish people. The Jews were taken into captivity for decades, 70 years. They were, already, uh, they were already in captivity for a while before the destruction of the temple, but for about 50 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, they were in exile, taken from their homeland. Think about it, from the exodus to the exile, about 900 years from when they were uh, freed and, and, and left captivity in Egypt to when they are in captivity in Babylon. It's like, here we go again, from the exodus to the exile, generation X. Now, it's hard for us as Americans to relate to how the Jewish people are feeling in 587 B.C., it's hard for us to picture another country coming in and defeating our military and overthrowing our government and stripping away our, our freedoms. That's, that's hard for us to, to relate to. One of our missionaries, Don Tingle, he was here with us last week, and Don has worked with people groups and refugees all over this earth who could definitely relate we, we oftentimes, we read this, and it just doesn't register in our minds. We're like, yeah, 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 they, they were taken into captivity. We read Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon. We sat down and we wept as we remembered Mount Zion there in Jerusalem. How can we sing the songs of the Lord when we're in a foreign land? They are crushed. They are devastated. It is their worst nightmare come true. So... Imagine 
the relief. Imagine the good news 50 years later that about 50,000 people are allowed to travel back to Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, to rebuild. It is a rebuilding season. Finally, after five decades, we get to go back to our home. Now, now it's been tough. Some of our moms and dads and our grandparents passed away while we were in exile, but we get to go back and rebuild. We get to rebuild a temple for our God. We get to have our own place again. Picture the excitement. Jeremiah, the prophet, he told us that this would happen because God has plans to prosper us, to give us a hope and a future. This is it. It's happening. We're going back. The Jewish people, they go back and they start to rebuild the temple for God. They build the foundation, they build the altar, but it wasn't that easy. And as life often goes, they met some challenges along the way of the rebuilding process. The Samaritans, the people of that region, they came in and opposed their work. And so now suddenly they're thinking, uh-oh, this just got hard. This, this just got difficult. It must not be the right time because this is not coming together like we hoped. This is not happening like we were amped about. Now you can read some of this backstory in chapters 1 through 5 in the book of Ezra, another homework assignment. Second Chronicles chapter 7, Ezra chapters 1 through 5. The rebuilding of the temple stopped because it got difficult. And for 14 years, anybody here 14 years old? Peyton, Ethan, Bruce, you raised your hand? Yeah. Not how you act, but just actually 14 years. For the lifespan of a Peyton Broyles or Ethan Montgomery, for 14 years, the people did not work on the temple. Now for 50 years, while they were in exile, that's all they thought about. We cannot wait to go back and rebuild. But the moment when it got tough, they put the project on hold for 14 years. And instead of working on God's house, guess what they did? They started building their own houses. And they forgot about God's temple. So the Lord raises up the prophet Haggai with a major message to call the people back to finish rebuilding the temple to be obedient and do what you've been called to do. Let's go ahead and look at the scripture. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. These people say the time has not yet come. What do you mean these people? Other places in the Old Testament, when God talks about his people, what does he say? He says, my people. He calls them my people. In modern slang, he would say, my peeps. But right here, it's these people. It's kind of like when my kids do crazy and stupid things, and I'll say to Jenny, you'll never guess what your son did. <laughs> or your kids did this. And she's like, what are you talking about? Your kids, they're your children too. Nope, only when they're cute and sweet and obedient, not when they're acting a fool. God says, these people, they're not my people. These people are saying, it's not the time to build my temple. So, so why are they thinking it's not the right time? Because of the opposition. The Samaritans were opposing them. In Ezra chapter 4, the people of that region discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to continue building. They bribed officials to keep the people of Judah from carrying out their plans. So the Samaritans are using scare tactics, and they're being oppositional. And what's really interesting is, whenever we receive opposition, we often think, well, maybe it's not God's will. Things just got difficult, and so it's not God's will. Things just got really hard, and so it's not the right time. What we need to understand is when we're doing something that God cares about, we're probably going to face opposition. Let me say that again. The closer we get to doing something that matters to God, the more likely we're going to face opposition. Receiving opposition isn't 
a sign that God is against you. A lot of times it's a sign that you're, you're doing what God wants you to do. So here's a question for us to chew on. Should we be more concerned when people are opposing us or when no one is opposing us? Maybe it should be a red flag when no one is opposing us because that could easily mean that we're not doing much for the glory of God. Because the moment that that you are obedient and you start to move forward and you do something that God called you to do, you can write it down. Some spiritual opposition is on its way. When you're being obedient to God and the task, the job, whatever it is, it gets difficult and it gets challenging. I want to encourage you guys today with this this one main thought, this one main idea. It's, It's right there on the back of your bulletins. With God's help, choose the hard right over the easy wrong. With God's help, choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Remind yourself and say this prayer, God, with your help and with your strength, may I choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Because listen, it would be real easy to quit focusing on God and just focus on myself. It would be difficult, but the right thing to do to continue building God's temple. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. It would be easy when someone hurts your feelings to hold a grudge and to stay angry at that person, but it's difficult and right to forgive others just as Christ has forgiven you. Listen, it's real easy to spend more money than you actually have. It is. It's real easy to go in debt, but it's hard and it's right to begin to climb out of debt. It's easy to give up. It's easy to not make a difference in this world. But as followers of Jesus Christ, with the help of God and his Holy Spirit, we choose the hard right over the easy wrong. The message of the prophet Haggai is the time is now. It's time right now to be obedient to the Lord. The time is now. I want you guys to think back for a moment. I want, you, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there some unfinished assignment in my life? Something that I left unfinished or, or maybe I never even started, but it was something that God called me to do and I didn't finish. Is there an unfinished assignment? If so, if that's the case, I want you to approach the rest of our time in the Word this morning from the perspective of your unfinished assignment. It could have been yesterday. It could have been a month ago. It could have actually been, uh, like, like the Jewish people in, in the text, it could have been 14 years ago where God put something on your heart. God put it on your heart to reach out to this person and share your faith with them. That would be hard and difficult And so you chose the easy way out. I felt like I was supposed to serve somewhere in the church. I was going to start that surfing ministry and and a Bible study at the beach. As a church, we felt called to be generous and give a certain ministry a gift, but we didn't do it. There was something that we felt like we were supposed to do. I I was called to write a screenplay. I was called to sharpen my my banjo skills and, and serve on the praise team. Ding, 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 ding. There's something on your heart that was a burden from God, but you didn't do it. I want you to think about that for a moment. God can speak to you the very same way he spoke to the people during the time of the prophets because we have his word from the prophets, major and minor, And in this context, guess what he's going to say to you? He's going to say, the time is now. Let's read on. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, and God asked, is it a time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house, my house, remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought. Think about how you're living. Is it a time for you you to be living in these paneled houses 
when my temple is left in ruins? Well, first of all, what is a paneled house? What's a paneled house? According to many Bible scholars, a paneled house was high-end living. Like these were nice homes. Maybe it was like living in Landfall or on Figure Eight Island, which God is not opposed to us having nice homes and nice things. He's against us putting those nice things ahead of Him. That's a worship disorder. God is not opposed to us having nice things. He's opposed to those nice things having us. Is it a time for you to be kicking it in your Yo MTV cribs? And at this point in time, the people, they were putting their own comfort ahead of building God's house and ahead of God as priority number one. Give careful thought to your ways. With any unfinished assignment from God, are you putting your own comfort ahead of what he is calling you to do? Are you trying to make a name for yourself uh, more than trying to make a difference for him? Are you putting your house before his house? Are you consumed with yourself instead of being consumed with him and sharing his love with other people? Is there something that you're putting ahead of God? Give careful thought to your ways. Because God wants us to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Two years ago in October, most of us experienced Hurricane Matthew right here uh, in southeastern North Carolina in some way. But we did not experience the storm like our friends in Lumberton. The destruction from the flooding was catastrophic. And if you're visiting with us This morning, two years ago, on a Sunday morning, we were sitting in pews, not not these nice chairs. As a result of the flooding from Hurricane Matthew, we heard about a church there in Lumberton, the South Lumberton Church of Christ, who lost everything inside of their building. And we, as a church family, we were at a place where we were able to donate our pews to that church. I remember the first time meeting the pastor there at that church. Billy Campbell. And as he was telling me the story, he was moved to tears. Each family, if they didn't leave town, because a lot of folks just left. They couldn't live in their houses anymore, and so they just left town, and they moved in with relatives in other parts of North Carolina, other states. Each family, if they could stay in their home, they spent a lot of time cleaning out and repairing their own homes, which, which makes sense, throwing out what needs to be thrown out and keeping what could be saved. And then he said something. He said it, it, it hit him <clears throat> one night, and it was these words uh, of the prophet Haggai. He said, we, we need to be rebuilding the church, the church building. Now, let me clarify for a second. These church buildings, like 811 North College Road, this this building that we're sitting in, it is not the temple of God. It's not. Collectively, as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, when we come together, we form the temple of God. But, But Pastor Billy said that he felt very convicted because it was almost like this place designed for the temple of God, the church to assemble and worship and fellowship, it had been forgotten. It was put on the back burner. And he said, it was like we were saying, the time is not now for, for us to, to rebuild. In verse 6, God says to them, you planted much, but you harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Whoa. What Haggai is doing right now is he's quoting from sections of the Torah from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, where, where, where the, the subject, the topic is obedience versus disobedience. Here's, here's a modern translation of verse 6. You're working your tail off and you still don't feel like you have anything. You're pouring your life into some career, and it feels empty and hollow. 
You have more than you've ever had, and you still don't feel satisfied. There's a longing for something more. You expected more by this time in your life. And God says, give careful thought to your ways. Think about it. Think about how you're living. Are you putting your house ahead of God's house? Is there some unfinished business? God led you to do something and you didn't do it. What about as a church? What about as a local congregation right here in Wilmington, North Carolina? You've planted much, but harvested little. Not an easy message from the prophet. I'm, I'm extremely thankful that when we come together on a Sunday morning as the church, as the body of Christ, or, or any other time, I'm extremely thankful that we worship a God who is loving and faithful and he is good. We're trying to create space for more people to worship him. Haggai comes with this message and the people are like, oh man, we got to build this temple and we're just not up for it. It's not going well. We're getting pushed back from, from the Samaritans. This is difficult. This is hard. Give careful thought to your ways. But then God, he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just leave the people hanging. The next thing God says through the prophet is, I'm even going to break it down for you into some simple steps. Uh, break it down. Here's what I want you to do. This is what God says. Here's what I want you to do. Number one, go up to the mountains. Number two, bring down the timber. And number three, build God's house. Build my house. Why? So he can take pleasure in it. And so he can be honored. This is how much I love you. I'm going to make it real simple. Are you ready? Here's what I want you to do. Go up to the mountain, bring down the timber, and build my house. Number one, go up to the mountain. Oh, wait a minute. Time out. Uh, psh, going up to the mountain, that, that sounds kind of hard. Have you seen the mountain? Have you seen it right there? I got asthma. I'm not a athletic. I'm not into hiking. That sounds difficult. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Bring down the timber. Uh, that sounds difficult. That sounds like some heavy lifting. I haven't been to the gym in a while. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Come down and build the temple. God says step by step. Here's one, two, and three. But first, I think I need to spend some more time, spend a little more time working out in the gym. What? I heard a comedian say, instead of calling the bathroom the John, Let's rename it the gym, and then we can say, hey, I went to the gym three times today. <laughs> God breaks it down into some initial steps, one, two, and three. The problem is, a lot of us, we want to ask the question, well, what about steps four, five, and six? I need the details. I need the details, like who's going to pay for this? Where does this fall in the budget? How is this going to happen? Where are all the extra volunteers going to come from? I need to know the deets, God. How much time is this going to take? And how long do I have to do this? I need steps four, five, and six. And God says, don't worry about steps four, five, and six. Just do one, two, and three. I'm guilty of that. I'm a planner. I want to know all the details. I want to know all the steps, how we're going to get there, what it's going to look like. I got backup plans for my backup plans. And God's saying, just do one, two, and three. Think about this. Jesus tells us if we want to follow him, if we want to be one of his disciples, we have to deny ourselves. We have to pick up our cross every day. It is a daily process. Well, what about tomorrow? What does Jesus say about tomorrow? Yeah, don't worry about it. Today's, today's all you need to think about. You see, a lot of times in this journey, you have to do what God showed you first before he reveals more to you. Sometimes we say, I want the details, and God says, you can't handle the details. I'll give you what you need when you get there, but you need to take the first step. What do you do? You go up to the mountain, 
and you get the timber, and you come down and you build my house. Well, my marriage, it, it's not very good right now, and, and I, know, I, I know you want me to work on it, but I'm just not quite sure what to do about it. You know, what do I do, God? Uh, number one, humble yourself. Number two, apologize for, 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 and ask for forgiveness for, for what you've done wrong. And number three, try doing what you used to do. Pursue your spouse, mountain, timber, build, step by step. This is what it means to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. There in Galatians chapter 5, we read about the fruit of the Spirit. This is what it means to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're commanded to do as followers of Jesus. And the time is now to take those steps. As you think about your life, as you think about your family, this church family, if there is an unfinished assignment from God, what do you do? What do we do? Here, here's one piece of advice. We quit talking and we start doing. That's it. Just quit thinking about it, quit talking about it, and go up to the mountain today. Be obedient and faithful today. Do the next thing that God has showed you and do it today because the time is now. You take those initial steps and, 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 and next Sunday, we're going to talk about the blessings that come from obedience. The blessings that come from the Lord on the other side of being obedient. Six months ago, I mentioned in, in a sermon, which was titled, Dare You to Move, Launch, you might remember this, I mentioned that the leadership of the church had been praying about and discussing five target areas to help us move, or today we can say to help us step in the direction of reaching our overall number one goal of making Jesus known. And those five areas were and are the food pantry, Springview neighborhood, the Vigilant Hope Homeless Ministry, adding more elders and adding a second worship service on Sunday mornings. Let's expand the ministry of the food pantry. We're located right here in this neighborhood. Let's love on our neighbors. Let's partner even more so with Vigilant Hope. Let's add more elders because more elders means more spiritual leaders for shepherding and discipling. And let's create space for new people to come into contact with the love of Jesus Christ. That's the direction we're headed with the goal of making Jesus known. Now that's what I said back in February of this year and those six months have flown by. Here's a question that I want us to consider. Are we collectively just talking or are we collectively doing? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard and challenging. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Well, I mean, when I think about it, when it comes to doing church, it would be real easy to just keep doing what we've been doing. Comfortable, with our own peeps, this is for us, by us. But when it comes to being the church and building God's kingdom, let's choose the difficult, challenging right, even with all kinds of opposition, over the easy wrong, so he can take pleasure in it, and so he can be honored. As the praise team comes up to, to lead us in singing, we're going to have a time of, of response right now, response to to God's word, God's message through the prophet Haggai. The time is now. Maybe you've got some sin in your life that has been plaguing you and you're keeping it a secret. It's a worship disorder and it's easy to keep, keep it a secret. It's hard and right to confess and ask for help. For some of you, you know that you need some Christian community in your life. Now, yes, you come out on Sunday mornings, but God has called you to be a part of an accountability group 
or maybe be part of a, a small group Bible study who not only digs into the word, but applies it and makes Jesus known. It would be real easy to just keep coming out on Sunday mornings and not making any eye contact with people and then leave real quickly afterwards. It would be difficult and uncomfortable and the right thing to do to truly open up your heart to a small part of this Christian community. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. For some of you, for some of you, you're thinking it would be real easy right now in my life to just keep looking out for number one, to, 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 to keep living your life for yourself. That would be easy. It would be difficult to surrender your life to another master, to deny yourself and, and be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everyone on this broken planet is in desperate need of a savior. And the good news is that Jesus Christ is the perfect savior. And his teaching is unconditional love. So as we stand and sing, let's stand together. If you want to talk about choosing the hard right over the easy wrong, if you want to talk about trusting God's faithfulness, repenting and being baptized and, and becoming a brand new creation, I want to encourage you to take the first step, which would be step out into one of the aisles, walk back to the lobby. Uh, Elder David Morgan, myself, we'll be back there. We want to pray with you. We want to talk with you about choosing the hard right over the easy wrong, and let's seek to obey God's will.